Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the uh, second lecture in the Law, Politics, and Media lecture series, which is being sponsored this semester by the Institute for the Study of Judiciary, Politics, and Media at Syracuse University, uh, which I direct, my name is Keith Bybee, and by the Carnegie Legal Reporting Program at Newhouse, uh, directed by this clean-shaven uh, young fellow to my right, uh, Roy Gutterman. Um, the Law Politics in the Media lecture series is associated with the Law Politics and Media course. It's based here at the law school, but uh, is cross-listed at Maxwell and Newhouse. And uh, the course and the lecture series together provide um, a venue for exploration of issues at the intersection of law politics and media, and also an opportunity to invite prominent practitioners uh, from both bench and bar, from politics uh, and uh, the press to uh, speak about these issues of concern. Today we are fortunate enough to have uh, Kurt uh, Wimmer with us. He is a partner at Covington and Burling, uh, not Covington and Burlington as uh, some of our initial... We get that a lot. Yeah, they do. One is a law firm, the other makes coats. They're often confused for one another. Uh, uh, Kurt is also a graduate of the College of Law, uh, class of 1985. Uh, he has had uh, a diverse uh, and interesting practice focusing on digital media, television, um, uh, mobile communications, publication, and new technology sectors. Uh, he has practiced both here uh, in the United States uh, and in London. Um, he has uh, testified before Congress and the uh, Federal Communications uh, Commission in addition to uh, international governmental uh, entities. Uh, he was for uh, three years, I believe, senior vice president and general counsel of Gannett Company. So he has uh, not only uh, practiced uh, outside uh, of a media company, but within it as well. He has uh, also advised uh, journalists, legislators, and uh, professionals in over two dozen countries about uh, issues of media protection uh, and the new media. Uh, he is here today to lead a discussion about the legal issues created by uh, the future of uh, the media in the United States. Um, he plans to speak for about 30 minutes or so, uh, and we will devote the rest of our time to Q&A. Uh, we will wrap up at 5 o'clock, and at that point, uh, I invite you to join us for a small reception, which will be held outside in the hallway. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Kurt Wimmer. Thank you. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, when I was at Syracuse a zillion years ago, the thing that I thought was the most interesting about what the university did was the interdisciplinary education, and this is a great example of that, so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I thought if it's okay with all of you, we could have, uh, since we're going to be talking about interactive media, maybe we could do this a little bit interactively, and feel free to um, interrupt with questions, comments, uh, when, you know, I, when I talk about something that you'd like to jump in on, please do. If you have a question, don't feel like you have to hold it until the end um, unless you'd like to do so. Uh, I always find it more interesting to be more interactive. I'd like to start with a, with a survey. How many people in the room subscribe to a daily newspaper? Well, I was counting on you two. Okay, this is a, that's actually a bit more than I thought. Um, how many have watched a network television broadcast newscast in the, in the past week or so? Pretty good, pretty good. I do this every time I do a talk, just, and it, just to sort of have a sense over time. How many of you think that your primary uh, method of keeping in touch with your friends is Facebook? Everybody? Email? I see some Facebook holdouts. This is amazing. <laughs> Telephone? Okay. Text? Yeah, okay. It's interesting. It's changed just dramatically over time. Uh, as you know, the traditional media is having a very, very difficult time making the transition to new media. And one of the things I thought uh, we might talk about today a little bit, since we're in the law school, is um, on the legal side, what are the lawyers that are involved in the media uh, thinking about as the business people that are involved in the media are looking for new business models? What on the law side are we trying to figure out that might help the business side make it to the other, uh, other end of a very difficult transition? Uh, before we start, maybe we might want to talk a little bit about how we, how we got here. Uh, obviously, in the early days of Internet publication, newspapers, magazines, uh, 
more newspapers, but some magazines, tended to put their content on the internet uh, for free, and that was easy to do because there was a, a point where it was a, easy to do a cross-subsidy if you were making you know, really excellent revenues, as most uh, newspapers and magazines were doing in the late, mid to late 1990s. Uh, and the news industry didn't particularly work together, so every company had its own strategy. There were some efforts to do cross-industry cross, cross strategies, like the Newspaper Next project, um, but really not so much. Most companies just pursued their own, uh, their own efforts. The TV business um, was uh, a little bit less impacted by the Internet at, at first, and it sort of took a different, a different strategy and most TV content wasn't on the internet to begin with. Um, and I think there was a little bit of complacency over the dot-com crash as well. Um, a lot of you, um, I don't know how, how many were really sort of uh, doing this 10 years ago, but if you think about the, uh, what was going on in the late 1990s, you had an enormous amount of economic activity concentrated on the internet. Uh, there were an enormous number of business models being funded, a lot of wealth being generated. Uh, you know, companies like Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, um, a lot of companies that are not around anymore, uh, created a lot of wealth. And then in the early part of the, this decade, um, in, in mid to late 2000, the bottom really fell out and the dot-com crash occurred. Um, I think one reason that we're here, where the, where the media industry is having a difficult time making the transition is during the early point of, uh, of the transition, during the late 90s to the early 2000s, um, there was a lot of effort made toward putting content on the Internet, exploring what the Internet could do for the newspaper industry in particular. And then when the dot-com crash occurred, it seemed as to a lot of newspaper executives that the Internet was really not going to be a significant threat to the print side. And there was, uh, I think, less attention given to it because of that, and you know, you still had investments being made in things like CareerBuilder.com, um, Classified Ventures, a lot of other things that the newspaper industry was doing to try to replace some of the lost advertising that it was starting to see from the internet. But overall, you know, you had a period of I think complacency where the newspaper industry didn't feel as threatened as it did in the late 1990s. And what I think the industry um, wasn't seeing was that consumer behavior didn't change. What really fell off the cliff were the business models that weren't going to work, the, um, you know, the enormous amount of um, hysteria that had built up in the stock market that was driving stocks to unreasonable levels. Um, but putting the business side of it aside, consumer behavior continued to, continued to change, and a lot of people who were getting their content from the Internet continued to do so, and in fact, those types of business models stepped up and kept growing. Um, so then when Craigslist hit um, in the early part of, of the 2000s, um, it really caused a dramatic impact. I don't know how many people realize this. It was new to me when I started in the newspaper business. Uh, but the amount of newspaper revenue that was accounted for by classified advertising was huge. Uh, you know, Woodward and Bernstein were basically being funded by your garage sale and my used car sale, um, which was a terrific thing for democracy and, and really interesting um, way to finance journalism, uh, but that went away fairly quickly um, and, and changed dramatically once the new businesses came on, like uh, Craigslist in particular, um, which is a really interesting phenomenon. I think one of, the most, um, one of the most potentially disruptive innovations is something that can move a market dramatically but doesn't have any particular capitalist leaning. So, you know, if you talk to Craig Newmark, who was the founder of Craigslist, um, he was asked, well, why don't you charge more for your ads? And he said, well, we went out to the users and they would prefer we sold ads for free. So we've decided not to charge for ads. And, you know, because he's a philanthropist, he was asked, well, wouldn't you like to charge more for ads so that then you could make money for your social causes? And he said, well, just leave the money with the users and let them, you know, use it for their social causes. Um, all of which are attitudes which are obviously sort of anti-capitalist, but at the same time, he created a very simple service that took a dramatic amount of advertising away from, uh, from the newspaper industry. And the other thing, finally, that happened that I think put us in the situation that we're in, there was always an assumption that digital advertising would grow to offset 
what we saw from online or newspaper advertising falling. So as newspaper ev revenues fell, the assumption was that digital online advertising would grow, and at some point the lines would cross. And the question always was, well, when are the lines going to cross? Because when the lines cross, we can really be comfortable that we've gone all digital and we can really sort of come out the other end of the transition and, you know, have a workable new media. Um, and a number of things happened in the sort of 2007 time frame. One was the recognition that the lines may not actually cross anytime soon because the amount that you can charge for online advertising is just not the same as it is for print advertising. I and mean, we talk about, um, you know, digital dimes to analog dollars, and that's not too far off. The problem is that you have, you know, absolutely unconstrained inventory on the net because, you know, the, the amount of advertising that can be sold to display on a web page, you know, is virtually unlimited. Uh, so all of that combined um, with the effect, of course, of uh, the uh, greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression um, really put us in a hard place in the newspaper industry. Broadcasting is also in a tough place. I think a lot of um, a lot of folks have not seen broadcasting as being quite at the same place where the newspaper industry is, but certainly going there. I mean, advertising uh, strategies of companies have just changed, and whether it'll um, perk back up when the economy does is an open question. I don't think it will ever go back to exactly the way it was. So the question is then, what, where are we now? So given, this, given the situation we're in, what can we do? So within the industry, um, and if any of you are involved in this, please pipe in and, and, and help, um, what you see is a broad-based search for solutions. Uh, the question of you know, whether we should be requiring people to pay to access content on the Internet, whether we should stop allowing our content to be, um, to be crawled by search engines and displayed on aggregator sites, whether we ought to have a completely new business model for mobile applications, uh, whether there should be you know, a different attitude about, among the industry about working together on some of these issues are all business topics that are being discussed. And there are corollary sort of legal sides to that. I mean, on the legal side, um, for example, there's a lot of thought being given to cross-industry cooperation, to what has to happen to be, to, for effective paywalls to be put up on the Internet. Um, IP protection is obviously an enormous one, as it is with any uh, digital content model. Um, unfair competition, the role of aggregators, uh, and of course the role of blogs, which is, um, I think, one of the more interesting new media versus old media clashes. Uh, Ariana Huffington, if you ever have a chance to sort of listen to her on this whole change to new media, has a very different perspective, which starts off with, why would you want to save these people? Uh, that's not usually where the rest of us are. Uh, to start off then on, on cooperation among industry players, um, for, a lot of, uh, for a lot of years, and any of you who've been in the media industry, um, particularly Roy, probably, probably know this, um, owners of media companies really haven't gotten along very well as an industry. Some industries work together very well. Um, in the late 90s, that wasn't so much the case. You're seeing a changing in the guard now. There are much more um, forward-looking, I think, CEOs who are looking for ways to cooperate. But of course, then we have the antitrust laws. Uh, so that's, that's one area that I, I put on the reading list and an area to think about is how should the antitrust laws be interpreted when you're talking about issues such as an entire industry starting to charge for content. And the problem, of course, is if the New York Times decides to charge for content, a lot of the audience will go over to the Washington Post. Washington Post will charge for content. A lot of the audience goes over to the LA Times. And the audience just keeps moving to where it can get the content for free. I'd like to be proven wrong on this, by the way. But I assume that the, the audience will continue to move to where it can get content for free. Um, and that makes it very difficult for the industry to move to a pay model. So there are people who are asking, shouldn't there be some way for the media uh, to make a concerted effort among all the owners to sort of say, here's, here's how we're going to do it. Um, we're going to all decide that we'll charge X uh, for our content. This is the way we'll, we'll work it out. That, of course, makes antitrust regulators really nervous and lawyers for media companies very nervous. And it's been, um, it generally hasn't happened. There have been third parties that have come up with ideas. Uh, some of you may know uh, Steve Brill, who's a, or have heard of Steve Brill, who's a, uh, a lawyer and uh, also a media company owner, 
who has created a company called Journalism Online LLC, which is trying to come up with some payment methods uh, that would be done outside of the media. You wouldn't have all the competitors in a room deciding what price to charge because that um, makes everybody's hair stand on end. But perhaps you could have a third party like Journalism Online coming in and saying, well, here's, here's how we could create a service that would give you a, a newspaper pass and you would buy your pass from us and it would go to all the different sites and you could you know, have, a, um, have a tailored approach to how you pay for content. So that's, uh, that's moving ahead. I've heard that there are something like 200 or so newspapers, you guys may know more, uh, that have indicated an interest in this. Uh, the New York Times, of course, has said that it's going to char start charging for content. Uh, and of course, a lot of uh, specialty publications do charge for content. The Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times come to mind. Uh, and those are a little bit of a different case because if you're in the financial business, you really have to have the Wall Street Journal and you have to have the Financial Times. And you might even be able to put those on your expense account. So it creates a different model than getting the Washington Post or the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times did charge for, for a while um, for something called New York Times Select, which was based basically on its, its opinion-leading columnists and other you know, types of the kind of high-value content that the New York Times had. But that was reversed a few years ago, and now they're looking for some way to re-engage in, uh, in that business. Uh, the other question, of course, is whether if we've lost the browser, should we just look ahead to the next business and say, well, uh, wouldn't it make more sense not to worry so much about the web? Because frankly, I think there will be, there'll be a time when we'll all spend a lot less time on the web and a lot more time with our smartphones and our iPads or whatever the next device is. Um, should, we, should we as an industry look at start, starting to charge for mobile? And this is, um, I think in a lot of ways, a much more promising avenue because people who are not conditioned to pay at all for web content are very used to paying for mobile content. In fact, we do it every day. We're very used to paying for, for content on a, on a mobile phone, on an iPhone, on a, on a, on a mobile device. Um, this probably doesn't involve the same antitrust issues because um, I have a sneaking suspicion that the third party that will drive that is going to be Steve Jobs and, and Apple. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with the iPad and whether that becomes a, uh, a model that we see a lot on. The other antitrust issue that comes up a fair amount is uh, the question of the standards that ought to apply to mergers. If anybody studied this, let me know. But the, uh, my understanding is uh, the Department of Justice takes a very sector-specific view toward assessing markets. And so when you go in with a television merger, uh, the Department of Justice will say, well, how much of the advertising market is, is uh, is represented by these two companies that want to combine. And if it's more than, say, 40 percent, uh, they'll tell you no. Uh, but in fact, those television stations compete with radio stations, newspapers, websites, outdoor advertising, uh, mobile advertising, lots of different things that doesn't fit at all into the analysis that the Department of Justice applies to television. Same thing is true of newspapers. The, DO the DOJ sees newspapers as their own market, which basically means mergers are almost never done within a market because that would be, uh, you know, a per se monopoly. Doesn't it make sense to look at, um, to look at mergers and to look at the media marketplace as one competitive marketplace? Because in fact, that's how it works. And any of you who have worked in media know that television competes with radio, competes with newspapers, competes with the internet, competes with outdoor advertising. It's, a, it's one enormously competitive field and antitrust regulation arguably ought to work the same way. So there is an effort uh, to persuade uh, the new head of the antitrust division to take a more uh, overall view of the media marketplace. And uh, some efforts have been made with the new um, head of the Department of Justice as well. Uh, the other area that's, that we're all spending a lot of time on, of course, uh, is IP protection. And uh, before getting into that, I guess um, the IP issues are raised mostly by virtue of um, three different phenomena. One, of course, is online aggregators. Um, Google News comes to mind. Um, other sites that sort of take a little bit of content. Um, and they 
typically operate on a fair use theory that uh, they're not taking enough copyrighted content to require a license uh, from the user. The crawling of the websites is done automatically. Google News, for example, will just put together using algorithms a, uh, a snapshot of the day's news based on what people are looking at. And frankly, it's, it's, it's a terrific product. Bing News is another one. It's also a good product. Uh, the problem, of course, is um, if Google puts together a snippet of information from one article, a snippet from another, a different angle from a third, um, a couple of thumbnail photographs, and a headline, it's pretty much replicated what most people will want to know about a particular story without anyone having to click through. And if you don't click through, of course, uh, the underlying newspaper or the un underlying broadcast station or website or blog isn't really getting any income from being on Google News. Um, so that raises one issue, and it goes to the scope of fair use. Uh, you know, is that really a fair use? Um, should they have to have a license for that? Should they have to have your permission for it? Um, it's one on which European publishers have taken a much harder line uh, than American publishers. And in fact, uh, Google News was sued in, in Belgium um, successfully by a group of Belgian publishers who basically said the European analog to fair use, which is called fair dealing, didn't permit the way Google, Google News was dealing with its, uh, with its content. Uh, the other issue uh, is just straight out infringement, and there's a massive amount of infringement on the internet, as, as anyone can tell you. Uh, that's true for uh, you know, all, all types of digital content, um, also for newspaper and broadcast content. Um, there was a study of the number of times that a typical uh, newspaper story was published on the internet without um, without authorization, and it was a significant number uh, because often a blog will sort of post the entire story as opposed to a snippet or a link. Um, a, a website might have might be collecting stories on a particular topic for their, for its readers and just paste full versions of the stories in. Um, so that's, that's obviously a concern which falls very much in line with the anti-piracy views of the motion picture industry, the music industry, the magazine industry, the book industry, everyone's concerned. Um, and of course the third area is the, um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Is anyone familiar? Excellent. Okay. Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed in the late 90s and creates a an assumption of um, sort of a notice and takedown procedure. So if, under the old rule, if you found out that a website was, um, was hosting copyrighted content and you own that content, you would say that the website should be um, responsible for infringing that content because it's hosting it. Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act looked at the way the internet was developing and said, Congress has decided that we need a different approach that will continue to allow the, the internet to develop as it's, as it's developing, but we also need something to protect copyright owners. So it set up a notice and takedown procedure, which basically requires every website to have someone to receive DMCA notices. Uh, if you find out that a website is infringing your content, you send a takedown notice to the person who's been registered as the DMCA agent. Uh, the website then gets the notice, um, has a certain period of time to, uh, to take down the content, notifies the party that posted it to begin with that it can raise a claim if it wishes, uh, that it can, co it can contest the takedown notice, and after some period of time, if there's a contesting of the notice, then the original person who, who sent the notice has to go ahead and follow through and file suit. Um, and in fact, suits don't usually result. It just this just results in takedowns. Um, there's one interesting piece of litigation about the DMCA, which is a suit that was brought by Viacom against YouTube. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, the allegation in that suit is that uh, the DMCA was created in an era when you would find out about your content being posted on, on a website or on a blog, and you would have time to deal with it. If you're Viacom, which of course owns Nickelodeon, MTV, VH1, uh, lots of other content networks. Uh, YouTube has videos being posted at the rate of thousands a minute. 
it's very difficult for you to keep up with doing your DMCA work if you're Viacom, and the burden is on you to figure out when your copyrighted information has been posted. So Viacom has basically said um, that YouTube, because of the way it's working, doesn't deserve DMCA protection. And it's, it's a very interesting suit that's being watched closely. Uh, I have to confess, in a way, I'm worried about both sides of that because um, as media companies, we are um, extremely concerned with DMCA protection. We like, the DM we like the DMCA because it gives us immunity unless, you know, we go through the process. And there's a little bit of a worry if a court were to buy one of Viacom's arguments, which is that if you're making money from this potential infringement, you shouldn't be subject to the DMCA. That could come back and sting those of us who are on the content side who really rely on the DMCA day in, day out. Uh, and then on the copyright front, there's also another, um, another strain of arguments that's starting to emerge that basically says, look, copyright, copyright as it stands now just isn't strong enough. We need to do more to protect um, our content industries. We should strengthen copyright. Uh, there's an article by Judge Posner that I stuck on your reading list that's basically said, uh, copyright law should be amended so that you can't even link to content without um, getting a copyright license. Uh, kudos to Judge Posner for sort of thinking creatively. However, I think that would be uh, just a little unworkable. And frankly, I worry if um, we as an industry go to Congress and say we'd like to reopen copyright law. Uh, there are a lot of folks involved in copyright legislation, copyright policy, that would say we'd love for you to open up copyright law and let's cut back on this fair use business. Let's, let's expand what we can do uh, with fair use. Let's go the other way. So in a, word, in a way, I think if we go to Congress and ask for copyright law to be strengthened, uh, there's a worry that I have that it'll go the other way and we'll actually be worse off. Finally, there's a, uh, a number of people who are concerned with, uh, with the free rider and aggregation uh, phenomenon. Um, who are thinking about litigation strategies that don't involve copyright, that sort of get to the same issues as copyright infringement, but use different theories. Uh, and one of those is unfair competition. Uh, there's a, um, an argument based on a 1918 Supreme Court case um, between the Associated Press and what was then its competitor, INS, where uh, the court acknowledged a cause of action based on unfair competition when a, a wire service took, uh, you know, took massive amounts of, of money and effort to go out and collect the news, reported the news, and within moments, the same news was being rewritten by a competitor and also spun out to newspaper clients. Uh, the court was sort of relying on kind of a sweat of the brow theory that if you put a lot of money and effort into creating the news, it was really unfair competition for your competitor to go out, rewrite it, sell it for money, and really for the reader, if the facts are the same, because news is, especially breaking news, is so based on the facts, the competitor is really reaping as much advantage from your work as you do. And there was, you know, at that point, a, uh, you know, a sort of emerging hot news doctrine under unfair competition law. Um, that is still around in a couple of circuits. Um, the Second Circuit, um, including New York, you can bring an action for unfair competition and the Associated Press um, actually brought one a couple of years ago and settled it favorably uh, to its members. I think it's a little bit problematic and difficult to think about how you limit something like that, especially, you know, as First Amendment lawyers, it, raise, it raises a few, com a few sort of complexities for you to think, well, um, let's come up with some legal theory under which I can penalize you for relating truthful information, which is essentially what the, what the competitor is doing. Uh, uh, when it's rewriting the news and relating it. Um, finally, I guess there's the issue of blogs. Uh, there's this very interesting debate in the blogosphere about the new media and the old media and whether uh, the problem with the existing media is that they're just not relevant enough and they could try harder and be more interesting and then people wouldn't go to the blogs to read the Washington Post story. They'd go to the Washington Post to read the Washington Post story. Um, that's, I think, a, an interesting debate. It doesn't strike me as particularly grounded in the law in any on one way or the other, um, except to the extent that the blog, um, you know, many blogs can persist in sort of posting an entire story 
and then talking about it and saying, well, that should be fair use because we're using the story as a springboard for discussion, or we're using three paragraphs of the story as a springboard for discussion, um, which, needless to say, many, um, uh, many newspapers and magazines disagree with. Uh, so before, before moving on, does anyone have any questions on this stuff? Thoughts? Is it all futile? Yes? You haven't said anything about it. ACTA. ACTA. The semi-secret treaty drafting. Oh. <laughs> I'm not an expert on ACTA. I, you know, I, I, my understanding of that issue um, is in this, this, let me just give a little background. You can tell me if I'm, if I'm onto the topic you're interested in. But the, um, there are uh, efforts among some in the content community to encourage ISPs to cut off people's internet access if they infringe copyright. And it's in Europe, for example, there's a, it's become a three strikes you're out program. And it was implemented in France, but struck down by the courts because uh, internet access is a fundamental human right in France, as it turns out. So only a, only a court can cut off your access to the internet. So it's being sort of reworked in, as it goes through Europe. Um, to where if, you find, if the ISP determines that you've been uh, you know, infringing copyright and has warned you three times, it can then go to a court to cut off your internet access. Um, and the treaty that, uh, that you've mentioned um, apparently had been discussed as uh, incorporating that kind of an approach so that it could be promulgated broadly throughout Europe and eventually work its way back into the United States. Um, Hard to say where that's going, frankly. Um, there was, in fact, a division among uh, people in the, co in the content community about whether three strikes you're out is workable. And some ISPs, of course, really don't want to get into the business of policing anything about content if they can help it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure where, that'll, where that will go. Yes? Doesn't all of this make it sweet for lawyers? Well. In a way, it does. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of work for lawyers. Uh, the piece that's not so sweet, unfortunately, is uh, as the potential client base doesn't make as much money as it used to, it doesn't hire as many lawyers. Um, and that has um, impacts that sort of broadly throughout the ecosystem. For example, there are you know, not as many FOIA lawsuits being brought, not as many people challenging closed meetings, not as many using state open records laws, because that's all legal work that can be cut during times of a crisis. And so there's less uh, of that being done. I know Associated Press is still doing it. I know Hearst is still stepping up. And there are many others who are. But overall, it's very difficult to continue funding a lot of that at a time when your revenues are so challenged. So there's a lot of interesting legal work. Um, it's just that the client base is sort of economically challenged, and that sort of constrains what lawyers can do. Yes. Go back to this point about cooperation between media players. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I do an archival work with New York Times, Boston Globe, which is called Boston.com, sure. the Washington Post. Uh, I go to New York Times. I may get the story for free, or I may have to pay three ninety-five. Go to Boston Globe. Maybe, maybe not. What drives this? You said there's no uniformity because right. it's not really. They don't work well together. Yes. Media players. Yes. So is it? Can I beat my uh, my opponent to the punch? Is it strategizing that's constantly going on? Is it right. surveying these sites? What drives it? You know, I think it's, it's two things. One, the reason that there really isn't any cooperation is because, first, for, for years, because of the, of the positions the department has taken on the antitrust rules, people have just been very skittish about it. Um, and then there's also been the sort of question of, well, how, you know, how can we cooperate? And people haven't really wanted to cooperate. Um, in terms of the archive strategy, which is an interesting one, um, I think, in a way, it's been much less driven by the legal side and much more driven by people trying to figure out what the strategy ought to be for archives. I mean, some people, I think, uh, have thought it would make sense to work with third-party players, uh, you know, to digitize everything you possibly can and make it available very broadly because it will draw people to your site. That sounds suspiciously to me like the old arguments during the 90s that didn't really work so well. Um, and then others think, well, if you come on my site and you're looking for an article from 1974 that was in the New York Times, 395 is, you know, fair price to pay. And so the, so I think, you know, it's it's gone through a number of cycles in terms of archives. I think it'll come around as having some sort of a pay uh, mechanism. I'd be surprised if there was a lot of cooperation on what to charge, frankly, because that, you know, each 
each, I think, newspaper magazine sees that as kind of their treasure trove of, you know, of content that goes back for years and years and probably has a different, a different approach to it. Yes? I'm wondering if there's any place for uh, talking about democracy in the antitrust context. Because you presented, well, there might be a way in which we could argue about uh, the rules governing mergers, which might be more friendly than even happening. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of an incremental. Right. Um, but alternatively, rather, you talked about what the significance of this business is, that it has significant larger than just um, dividends yeah. for shareholders, but that it plays a role as a fourth branch of government. Right. And so there ought to be an antitrust exception for media companies. And so is there any traction to that? It's, a, gr it's a great point. Or? It's a great point. And really, the, that, um, the whole sort of fourth estate idea kind of permeates a lot of, a lot of these issues. I've been focusing on this really from the industry perspective, but there are some parts of this that clearly have normative consequences. And one of them that worries me a little bit is the concept of putting up paywalls. Um, you know, there, is, there are a couple of international treaties that deal with free expression, and they all say that citizens should have a right to free expression beyond, you know, regardless of borders, regardless of frontiers. And for many years now, we've, we've finally had a medium that does that with the internet. And as we put up paywalls, we're creating those frontiers that will prevent people from being able to access content. Um, and I think in particular, you mentioned in my introduction, thank you for that, that, the, that I've done some work in other countries, especially emerging democracies. And it's very interesting to see the effect of the ability of someone in Croatia or Bosnia or Serbia uh, or East Timor to be able to access a New York Times account of what's happening in their country. It's really significant. And you know, aside from the BBC World Service and a few of the other um, you know, international media outlets, uh, the rest of the world, to some degree, and they won't admit this, of course, because it sounds too pro-American, relies on American media dramatically. And as we put up paywalls, I think, in a, in a, in a way, I could, I'm worried about what happens internationally with free expression. Uh, is it going to be easier for despotic governments to continue to oppress people if they can't, I mean, Iran is a great, a great example, if they can't access the internet um, to read uh, what's going on in their own country, not because of their country's uh, possibly illegal um, views of this under international treaties, but because we're all putting our content behind paywalls and they can't afford to access it. Um, the antitrust side, um, has really kind of made people nervous kind of for the opposite idea. There's the, the, uh, there have also been, and I haven't even mentioned this because I think it's so outlandish, there have been proposals for Congress to bail out the media. You know, that Congress was really in the bailout business last year, and there was a lot of, a lot of bailing out going on. Um, and, you know, where I was sitting at Gannett, we were about 1,000 feet from FDIC, and, you know, so it was very easy to say, look, bring the truck over here. <laughs> um, but... There was a lot of, I think, reasoned uh, discussion that basically led a lot of people to the conclusion that the government really can't be in the business of bailing out the media and really probably shouldn't give a special antitrust exemption to the media or probably shouldn't give special favors to the media because the media is reporting on the government. And there's this worry that if you had a relationship with government where you were getting special favors, maybe you wouldn't report so aggressively on the government. Um, I tend to think that's a little overblown because there have been subsidies for the media, you know, from day one in this country. I mean, postal rates for newspapers were always lower than general postal rates. And that, you know, over the years has accounted for hundreds of millions of dollars of subsidies to the media. No one suggested that, you know, we've somehow gone soft on our reporting on the federal government because of getting a benefit in postal rates. But I do think it makes it harder for people to think about things like a special antitrust exemption for media. Uh, we face that a little bit in looking at creating uh, a special testimonial privilege for reporters to keep confidential sources, for example, which is currently moving through Congress, uh, where people say, well, gosh, should, should you really be asking Congress for things while you're reporting on Congress? Yes? Um, in all of the readings and just across the board, and I work as a journalist, that uh -huh. we are able to say without a doubt the inability to have our reporting finance by paywalls or whatever sort of schedule or model we have affects the quality of journalism. So granted, if you're arguing that paywalls are a barrier to democracy and it doesn't allow people in East Timor to know what's going on in their own community, the fact that we no longer have specific bureaus or bureaus of 
fraud. That means that a person in East Timor isn't getting the quality of journalism anyway. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering how, I mean, because seemingly in this whole big debate, no one considers that journalism is an expensive venture. And it's not one, I mean, it may have been very easy for Madison and all the other founding fathers to write the, the Federalist Papers, and, you know, they were wealthy gentlemen, and the same thing for the guy who runs Craigslist. But for the good number of us who are working journalists who start off, unfortunately, at an salary of 18500 yeah, it's not easy to be a journalist, and it certainly isn't easy to be an enterprise reporter, and no one gives any sort of credence to that. So I'm wondering which is better, to have free, crappy journalism, because we can't afford to write put the resources behind it, or to have people pay for it, largely in this country, so that it's available, at least to a certain extent, to people um, on a good quality basis. It's a great point, and the, uh, I don't think there's any question but that we need new business models so that we can pay for journalism. Um, you know, we focus a little bit on, on paywalls as one possible model. Uh, I think there are lots of others, and you know, the, the business people are you know, constantly looking at new ideas. Um, in the television area, for example, you might have one station uh, pool news coverage with another station. That, that's occurring in this market, it's occurred in many others, uh, to decrease costs but try to keep news coverage going. Uh, you know, there may be others, and we all hope there will be lots of other interesting ideas, you know, coming out. But if, if I had the, you know, the the basic choice that, that your question implies, you know, should we fund better journalism or you know, get better circulation for whatever journalism we can afford, obviously I'd go for the first. And you're right, it's an expensive proposition, um, especially when it comes to international bureaus and the like, which, uh, you know, we haven't talked about this, but the, the, the diminishment of international bureaus is a real concern. I mean, there are just so few of them left here. And so little, you know, compared, the war coverage is, is much less than it has been in the past. And I think it's interesting that the idea here is that, oh, if, you know, we, because um, quite frankly, given the idea between bailing out banks and bailing out the media, I was going to know where I stand on that, but I just think that <laughs> given um, the fact that it's written in our Constitution that a free press is something that we absolutely need to have, and quite a few of our founding fathers said that they prefer to have a free press as opposed to Congress even, um, yeah, bailing out the bank, I don't think is something that we should have done. But, even so, the debates that have been going on in Washington with regards to this comes out of the Department of Justice and have them going, having them say, well, we are too easy, we are too okay with the idea of bailing them out because the newspaper organization overwhelmingly is liberal, and we don't particularly care to support that. Again, giving no credence to the idea that this is an institution in this country that is absolutely necessary. So even the argument concerning this is partisan and biased against an entire institution that's absolutely necessary. So I actually think it works against the newspaper industry, whereas everyone's going, well, if they bail us out, then the newspaper's going to get special favors. We can't even get the argument going in the right direction. Yeah. Well, you know, the other, the other point that's sort of interesting and is related to what you're saying is uh, we sort of take for granted that the kind of journalism that we need to have is journalism as we would think about it, professional, moderated, edited journalism. Um, and you tend to see um, in a lot of emerging journalism uh, venues a different type of journalism. It's advocacy journalism, it's based on you know, one blogger's view of the world, uh, and it, it does raise the question for me, uh, you know, have we come to the end of the period of objective journalism? Uh, if you think about it, we really haven't had that period for very long. I mean, there was no objective journalism when the founders wrote the Constitution. Everything was advocacy. Uh, you know, in, until sort of the mid twenties of last of the last century, it was all sort of yellow journalism, back and forth. And then over time, we created this professional journalism atmosphere, which is I think has been um, enormously beneficial. But if you go anywhere else but the U.S. and to some degree England, uh, you'll find that you've got to look at several different papers to get the the whole picture, several different blogs. Uh, I wonder if the, if the period of time when objective journalism has been possible is coming to an end because people just feel more comfortable reading advocacy journalism or watching Fox News or watching MSNBC or making your choices based on your predisposed mindset about what you want to see. I think well, the studies have definitely shown and studies have shown that most people look, seek out the content that reaffirms their worldview anyway. So, I mean, I, 
sort of interested in the idea of whether or not objective journalism is something that this country wants anyway. I mean, there are clearly those who just want the story as it is, but for the most part, um, people sort of look for stories written in a way or by the people with whom they feel most comfortable and reaffirms their worldview anyway. So, personally, I'm not all that worried about it. If you want left leaning, then you go read something, and if you want right leaning, then you load up this, and you kind of make your own decision. Yeah. Yeah. We're important, you decide. As a yeah, person. exactly. I, I, I I had a very interesting discussion with a cab driver the other day about um, what journalism we like to read. He said, I like to read Fox News because they let me draw the conclusions. Yeah. I thought, well, that's very interesting. Right. Um, but at the same time, it's, it may be a different conclusion than I would draw. And um, I wonder if at some point after we've had this period of transition, we'll come back to a point where members of the public will say, look, I'm, I'm tired of reading six blogs. I'm tired of watching four TV stations. I'm tired of looking at three different news sources. And, you know, all my friends on Facebook are telling me different stuff. I'd like to have something like the New York Times. Can we reinvent moderated professional journalism? And, you know, maybe that'll be a unique selling proposition. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Yes? Um, the Associated Press for 100 years function as a cooperative without rising to short of merger. Um, would a unified web strategy work the same way, or would it have worked the same way, led by the Associated Press, if Google News and the big news weren't here? I think that's a really interesting question because you know, as you look at the newspaper industry, and it's sort of splintered and always has been a little splintered. The one organization that really can speak for the industry is the Associated Press, and it's as, as you mentioned, it's a cooperative. So you have not only the Associated Press itself generating news content, but all the members of the Associated Press contributing their content to this cooperative of news. Um, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, for, for many years, the AP resisted having a consumer-facing news service um, for the reason that it was selling its news essentially wholesale to its members, and that really worked if you were selling the same AP story to the newspaper in Wichita, Kansas, and the next and the same AP story to the newspaper in Kansas City, Missouri, those, you know, on paper, those markets didn't intersect much, so it, it was valuable to both customers. Now everything's on the web, and, you know, it just doesn't make as much sense as it used to make. Um, I think it would be a very different market now if, um, if the news industry had, uh, you know, in the late 90s come up with something that was like Google News, um, so that you could, you know, use that, plus generate advertising revenue back to the owners. Uh, whether the cat is too far out of the bag now, I don't know. It's an interesting question. But the AP really is the one entity that I think could lead it because it's the one, it's the one part of the industry that has broad appeal and broad membership. Yes? Um, it seems like the uh, media industry has only a certain amount of time to act, perhaps. You know, um, specifically as a consumer of media, I'm frustrated because I see more and more of my papers laying off more and more staff or eliminating sections or, I mean, even in uh, New Mexico where I live, uh, uh, the AP is cut down on staff. Sure. So there's even less of the aggregated news coming from the AP. Um, and it would seem like the media industry as a whole has only a certain amount of time to act before their product before they basically devour themselves, just cutting back constantly on the re on the services that affect people who have come to rely on as coming from newspapers. So, I mean, after a certain point in time, I just won't want to buy whatever it is the New York Times puts behind a paywall. Right. So, like, how long do they have? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, you can look at what's happening with the news in the newspaper industry now as sort of a spiral downward because you know as journalists get cut, less content produced. Less, um, less put in papers, smaller newspapers, and at some point, the public says, uh, cancel. There's just not enough in it for me. Um, and then you sort of see where it devolves. Um, I actually think there's some time. Uh, if you look at, you know, there are, you know, some signs of advertising resurgence that you see with companies like Gannett, uh, the New York Times. Uh, there are there are a ton of bankruptcies now. I mean, there. There's absolutely no question about that, but there are plenty of uh, newspaper companies that are still staying afloat and staying strong. Tribune's going to come out of bankruptcy in the next couple months. So, you know, I think there's, uh, I think there's some time, but 
obviously there have to be new business models. And there really has to be something dramatically done. Yes? What's going to happen for bed? Well, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the LA Tribune Times and the Wall Street, the Wall Street Post are no longer there. What is the Google and big news going to do to get their news? Yeah, oh, well, it's a great point because Google pre creates none of its own content. That's, a, that's the point. I mean, what, what's going to happen? Sooner or later, speaking about your cross lines, we're going to come, up, come into this room not knowing what's going on in this world. You know, I think, I think you're right, and if, if uh, and Google will tell you, if you sort of say to it, look, you're making more money than the entire newspaper industry put together, you could buy every newspaper in the country with, you know, with what's in your bank account, um, why aren't you sharing some of that with, with us, the newspaper industry that's creating all this content that you need to live? Because if you didn't have it, you wouldn't be, you know, you would have no products to market. So you're saying, have Google News write a check by clicks to wherever they source their news. And if you suggest that to Google, they'll say, well, we're doing exactly that. We send you billions of clicks to your own websites through Google News every day. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because there was a study done um, that was released a few weeks ago that said 44% of readers who look at Google News actually click on something. The other percent, the other 60 some odd percent never click, or 50 some odd percent never clicks. And so, you know, more than half the people who look at Google News aren't coming back around to the newspapers, and so those newspapers get no benefit. Um, Google would say, well, we're sending you tons of traffic. It's your fault that you're not monetizing it. You need to be more interesting. You need to be more persuasive. You need to sell better advertising. Um, I do think your point is exactly right, that if we can't figure out some other model, and some of the options involve uh, tough love with Google, for example, you, can, you, can, you don't have to make your content available. As Google will tell you, and, you know, Rupert Murdoch said, I'm going to take all my content off of Google, and Google said, fine, you can do that. Um, you can put up a, the robots.txt protocol. We won't crawl your site. You can tell us you'll opt out of Google News. Um, if more people did that, maybe there would be a licensing arrangement that would be sensible, negotiated with ag aggregators. Um, but, you know, it's a very difficult thing to pull the plug because a lot of people in news organizations especially on the advertising side, look at that stream of traffic coming in from Google News and say, well, I can't do without that. It's a little bit like, you know, like a drug you get addicted to, and then you say, well, I need to pull the plug on that so that we can do something more interesting, more profitable, better for the long term. It's difficult to do because they get used to that traffic coming through. So it's a difficult, yes? What role do you think polarizing networks like Fox News and MSNBC would lead to mistrust? It's a great question. The, the um, trust levels are down. I mean, there's no, there's no question about it. I think, um, I think it's been a number of things. I think that has. I think the fact that um, more people have come to simply internalize that whoever's telling them the news has a point of view uh, than has been the case in the past. Uh, for I think for a while, people thought, well, at least with Fox News and MSNBC and whoever I'm thinking of that has a that has a perspective, it's out on the table. I'm getting that perspective, and I can figure out where I want to go with it. But I think it does have a follow-on effect that basically has people thinking, well, okay, I just heard that from, uh, you know, from Diane Sawyer, what's her agenda? And, you know, once, the, once you sort of get in that mindset of the what's your agenda question, everything seems subjective, everything seems questionable. Well, especially now that you see Dan Milbank and people like that, really start to pick sides, it's becoming more obvious of where people Yeah, it's very true. And it, I think it does have a has an effect on the overall ecosystem. <coughs> yes? You, you came to our uh, symposium this past weekend. I did, yeah. So we talked about, the, I don't know if you were there for the broadband plan. I was good, unfortunately. Not. But, I mean, here... So the FCC is going to be discussing their broadband plan this coming in March, I guess, and and uh, there's there was a report recently, the Berkman Center's report from Harvard about the United States dropping from the first quintile, like one or two in the world for broadband penetration, to being 18th, and and it would seem to me like 
the media or the content providers would have a, a natural interest in increasing broadband penetration to increase audience. Sure. But I don't, I mean, especially like if you have some audiences which are primi primarily served by print publications and you feel like you're, you know, these might be people who would naturally come onto your online websites. Like, wouldn't you want more broadband penetration? And, and I guess my question oh, yeah, to that absolutely. is, where, where are the content, you know, where's the content coalition on that issue? You know, it's interesting because the, the only worry that the content industries, I think, have had about um, more broadband has been that more broadband almost always equates to more piracy. So if you're in the motion picture, organ, motion picture industry, you didn't worry so much about movie piracy, um, except on DVDs, back before people had broadband. Now they have broadband, you worry a lot about BitTorrent. Um, but aside from putting that aside, I think most content producers, if not all content producers, are very in favor of more broadband because it means more ways for them to push out interesting content to the audience. Um, there are a number of things going on with the FCC's broadband plan that make um, content industries nervous. One of them is uh, the proposal that the FCC has floated to start taking spectrum away from broadcasters on the theory that it needs to go to wireless broadband providers such as Verizon and AT&T and Sprint so that they can provide more wireless mobile service using the spectrum the television stations use which of course makes television stations very nervous because even though most people get their TV from cable, from satellite, uh, or from a telco, uh, without that, without the spectrum, they can't really serve the last 10% of the population that's not getting it that way. They can't serve all the other televisions in the house that aren't served that way. Plus, they can't provide mobile service, which is something that television broadcasters are launching now, which is really seen as important. Um, so I think, I think generally they, they'd be behind the broad, broadband plan. Um, the other related issue is net neutrality, uh, which is this whole range of issues around how the FCC should regulate the Internet. Should it um, prevent uh, ISPs from discriminating against different content providers? Should it, um, uh, should it uh, sort of require them to be more transparent about how they provide service and when they're going to cut down on service because you're using too much capacity and the like. Um, you know, on those issues, I think a lot of content providers have just stayed on the sidelines, uh, largely just because they're trying to figure out exactly which way they should come out. I mean, if, in fact, um, you were able to go to Comcast and say, look, I've got this, you know, we're the television stations in Syracuse, we've got this terrific idea for a new broadband service, uh, that's going to be, you know, video on demand for, you know, subscribers to your system in Syracuse. Can't we cut a separate deal that will give our subscribers preferential access so they get higher quality? Maybe that's a good thing for the industry. On the other hand, if you're a public interest advocate, you might say, well, wait a minute. That means that somebody else is going to get slowed down, and why should there be a benefit to a certain special class of providers just because you've got a deal when everybody else is getting slowed down. So I think in a way a lot of these issues around, around broadband and net neutrality have been puzzling to the industry and we really haven't figured out exactly which way we should come out. I think it's very interesting with regards to net neutrality. I think in this country we generally, and we haven't made this stuff like Europe has, but we generally have an idea that the internet should be free for everyone and that it should, not, should, should come with no regulation. Which is interesting because you have to pay for it, yeah. but um, which is kind of like cable, right? Like you, they have a whole bunch of these sort of leniencies that they can have um, because you have to subscribe to it and not serve in the public interest and the public good. But with regards to internet and largely journalism, um, we think it's okay to sort of regulate them in that model, even though in some cases you have to pay for them. So it's kind of like if you're doing net with regards to net neutrality and internet, they're being bent over backwards in other ways that isn't legitimately fair because um, they should have the ability to regulate their own contents given the fact that you have to pay for this service. Therefore, you're not just giving it free and don't have to serve the public interest. But because there's so many people in this country who want it, and I'm wondering how that's going to work, especially with regards to net neutrality, because it's in Comcast's interest to make money off of the service that they provide. How dare the government yeah. say to them, no, you can't 
make it quicker for this person who's going to pay you six million, as opposed to Ms. Smith, who's only going to pay you thirty nine dollars a month. Right. I think the way it'll, I mean, there there will have to be some sort of region, reasonable network management uh, permitted by the ISPs, or else. Um, Essentially, what we'd be into is a government-mandated flat rate, all you can eat for everyone at some, and it doesn't work. I mean, I, I do think the most reasonable thing that I've heard is, um, you know, some sort of a tiered system where at least we're transparent. Um, I do think it's the end of all you can eat broadband, um, except for a high cost, and I'm not sure that's a bad thing, frankly, because the 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 way it's working now is a very small number of users um, that are heavy BitTorrent users are using something like 70% of the capacity of the internet, and the rest of us are essentially subsidizing that in our flat rate broadband fees, because we're not using that much. Um, and so I wonder if there's, there's going to be more equity in the long run, but I do think the internet might get more expensive for people, you know, especially as you know, high, you know, more higher, higher bandwidth and faster services roll out uh, from Google and others that are going to push the envelope. You know, are they going to be less fast than what we're getting? Um, are we going to have to pay more for them? And frankly, people coming from environments like this one, where you've got really terrific broadband, um, high speeds, lots of BitTorrent, um, you sort of think, well, you know, how, how do we replicate this in the commercial world? And it may be that we don't, that there's something else that happens. Um, I also think on, on broadband, the, um, the statistic that we're somehow 18th in the world or 27th in the world, depending on which report you read, um, I find that a little bit deceptive because if you think about South Korea, for example, you wire one apartment block and you've got massive penetration. Yeah, they got 100 megabit per second broadband to you know huge pieces of Seoul, but you know how easy it is it how easy is it compared to the United States where we have Wyoming and Montana and uh, the Grand Canyon and you know these enormous land masses that are really a little bit more difficult to wire than a country the size of Massachusetts. So I, I think the comparisons are a little bit funky. But. We have time for one more question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting about the content uh, and paying for it, which is basically what this subject matter is about, right. is that the public is willing to pay ESPN $5 a month to get all the sports that they can eat. Right. And they're not willing to pay one tenth of one cent to get quality news. It, it doesn't exactly blow my mind, but there's no equalization to this thing. Yeah. It's very strange. Um, Cablevision uh, bought Newsday on Long Island and started charging for it. Um, and of course, they, it's a little bit different because they um, they provided free access to anyone who subscribed to the paper and free access to anyone who subscribed to cable. Um, so, you know, given that they're the dominant cable provider in that area, that covered a lot of ground. Uh, but can anyone guess how many people actually subscribe to Newsday outside of? 35. About 3,500, 35,000, 35. <laughs> so now, it's a little bit odd because you had you know, every subscriber already having a, a subscription, every cable subscriber having a subscription. So it's not a very good uh, mechanism, but it's it's worrying. And I do think in, in a way that the public's hesitance to pay on a browser is something that um, is going to be very hard to dislodge, and we'll have to focus on mobile devices. And I just can't believe it when I see new iPhone applications in the me with media content coming out for free. It's unbelievable to me. We, we've just been through this with the browser. And I, I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens with iPad applications when they start to roll out and whether people start um, being a little bit more reasonable and paying for uh, terrific versions of Sports Illustrated or Time Magazine or Newsweek uh, or the New York Times. Uh, there's a very interesting, um, it's a little bit of vaporware, but there's a very interesting video on YouTube, of course, on YouTube, uh, of the Sports Illustrated tablet demonstration. And if anyone's interested, you, you can just um, Google Sports Illustrated tablet, um, and it demonstrates what the tablet could do with Sports Illustrated content. And it's basically, uh, you know, paging through the pages. If you want to zoom in on a photograph, you can. If you want to say, I want my hockey first, my football second, my baseball third, you can get that. 
um, you can press and get a video. I mean, it's a very interesting demonstration and shows the capabilities that you, we might be able to get to in a mobile environment that you know, might start to take uh, a little bit of slack off of the fact that we're not really charging on in the browser. Thank you very much. Yep.